morning, guys. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> title this message about we want to give God a sacrifice of our best and the acceptable sacrifice he wants is our worst. He wants our sin. I'm like, man, when he started dealing with me about that, I was like, man, God, okay, I, I get some of it. But, so, I'm going to kind of, I'll probably throw, put some scriptures in here too, but. What, what are you hiding? Let's go to the story of Cain and Abel. If you're, if you do good and accept your sin, but if you don't do good and don't accept your sin, it's because sin lies at the door. He wants us to rule over sin, not sin rule over us. Cain went away angry. His countenance changed, became more sin. It's kind of like. I mean, I'm just going to throw this out there. It's kind of like the abortion issue, guys, okay? It's just one sin covering up another. The sin of, you know, pretty much most of it's sin out of wedlock. Sex out of wedlock. Convenience. It's all kinds of things, you know, we, but, but that's a whole other issue, so I'm not going to go down that road, but that's just... Then look at the Garden of Eden. Adam, where are you? <laughs> okay, I had to find this guy, sorry. Adam, where are you? God knew where he was. He created heaven and earth. They were silent. They were hiding because of sin, because of their nakedness. They disobey God. So, this is part of what I'm saying, guys, okay? I'm going to get there in a second to the rest of this. You just got, please listen to this whole message because it's, it's really, really imperative, okay? It dealt with me a little bit ago, maybe a few weeks ago. He said, look up the Sound of Silence song. I'm like, I kind of remember that, you know, as a kid. It was written in 1963. I'm just going to read a couple couple things of it. Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again because a vision softly creeping left its seeds while I was sleeping. And the vision that it planted in my brain still remains with the sound of silence. And then at the end, to the neon god they made, and the sign flashed out its warning in the words that it was forming. And the sign said, the words of the prophets are written on the subway walls and the tenement halls and whispered the sounds of silence. The enemy wants you to be silent, guys. God wants you to come to him with prayer and supplication. Cry out to him. It's time to cry out, weep between the porch and the altar, guys. All of us, you know, I've got this video out about a storm coming to America. I even had to date it. I don't like to do that. But, and then he told me it was 8-11 when it started. And this was like 8-6 or something when I had the dream. Period of prayer went through that, but he told me, he said, the storms are first gonna come to my life, mine and my wife's life. Man, all hell broke loose, guys, or so I thought, and it just got worse and worse and worse and more things, and right now, probably got a half a dozen of them going on. <clears throat> One of them was self-inflicted, pretty bad, kind of ugly. But when it finally came out, it didn't come out because, I, because I've got caught as much as it, because I prayed about it for months. Kind of knew it was there, kind of didn't, but it was hidden. He wants that ugliness. Why? Does he want you go to a wedding, and especially if it's a family member, you want to buy him something nice. You know, you feel bad if you you would feel bad if you went and didn't go and get him something. 
The marriage supper of the Lamb is calling us to the wedding. He wants his bride to be spotless, pure, clean, without blemish or wrinkle. So you buy him something nice. You know, or on their registry or whatever. So our thinking is, you know, hey, I'm going to go to the king. So I'm going to buy him not something nice. He doesn't want your money, guys. He doesn't want your ability, guys. He wants your availability. <clears throat> I wouldn't, you know, we want to give him the best we have, of course. And he wants the worst we have. Why? That's what I asked him. I was like, man, God, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Kind of, kind of does and kind of doesn't. You know, my spirit, it did, but I hadn't got there yet. Why would you want our worst? The darkest places in our hearts where well, we won't even go. And told our wives or spouses, we hide it from ourselves, from God, like Adam did, and Eve did. That's why he wants it, because that's what separates us from the love of, of God. And that was the whole point of the cross of Jesus, to take our sins. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. <clears throat> he was the sacrifice, guys. That's why he said, he said he couldn't find any man that was worthy of the sacrifice, so he had to send his son. Instead, we want to hold on to that. Why would we want to hold on to this trash and garbage? Because the enemy's lying to us, guys. He wants that dirt places that we won't go. Why? Because it'll set us free. That's what he did when he went down to hell, took the keys to the death, hell, and the grave. He wants the worst in our lives so we can live a victorious life, guys. Not a religious sacrifice, you know, oh, I gave, you know, I gave a million dollars or whatever, or, you know, look at the widow's might or the, you know, that whole story. <clears throat> Well, he doesn't need our he doesn't need our stuff, guys. He's got uh, he just doesn't. You know, it's like me at Christmas. I try to keep like you know my kids ask me you know what do I want. I try to keep something inexpensive like a belt or some socks or something that they don't spend a lot of money on. Cause you know I mean I don't want to spend a lot of money for one, and you know even if they do have it, it and I appreciate the thought. But if I need something, I just go get it. Or I will ask my wife to go get it. You know, if it's something that has to be, you know, picked. Because she's kind of picky on the clothes and stuff like that. But me, I'm, you know, I don't care. A belt's a belt. But to honor her too, you know, it's like, okay, honey, you know, I need a belt. <clears throat> Either I'll have to go with her or let her pick it out. But... He wants our worst, not our best. Like, man, it kind of seems opposite, honestly. So it's like, okay, God, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get there. I'm going to get really nail this point home in a second. <clears throat> because that's what's separating us from the love of the Father. Two, two stories, true story. They're, they're not even stories. One was a vision I had a long time ago. It's in a book that I wrote in 2015. You can get a copy of it. Just email me. I'll send you a copy if you want, or it's on Amazon. It's called Visions and Writings of Promise, Hope, and a Future for America. And then there's a vision in there. And in this vision, I don't even need the book because I remember it. And in this vision, I was standing there in this beautiful garden. You know, Jesus appeared before me in the garden. And he said, how does your garden grow? And I'm like, look, God, there's trees over here that are beautiful. The hedges are manicured. The lawn's kept up. The, everything just looked green and good. And, but over in the corner was this dark, dark room spot and it was attached to the earth 
and it smelled like death and it looked like death and it was just black dark and I wouldn't even go there and Jesus eyes focused in on that with fire in his eyes and I knew I had to go there with him and when I went there he went in and the light shone Darkness went, had to flee, and I was set free. So, here's a couple of them. Okay, so he wants those dark, dark spots, guys, in your life that you... Sometimes, you know, sometimes people have them from childhood all the way up till in their 60s, you know, or 70s. Places you won't even go. That's the acceptable offering that he wants. He doesn't want a burnt offering from us. Didn't want our best. Didn't want our money. Didn't want our finery. Our, us to say that we sacrificed time. A lot of that, I went in this, was in this denomination. A lot of that's religious garbage, anyhow, honestly. <clears throat> he wants your obedience, your availability. He wants to walk with you in the cool of the day and talk to you in the cool of the day. But that sin is separating you. I want to say three, three, th three, three, three stories here that are going to help. <clears throat> One is about the prodigal son. One is about a dog named Precious. Well, two, so two. Okay. So the prodigal son, I was just praying one day, and it was just, man, it just kind of was like, okay, there it is. It kind of dawned on me. All right. Here's the prodigal son. He said he was in a far off journey, stole his dad's inheritance, stole all the money, defamed the name, shame, guilt, condemnation. He's off riding, righteous living. You know, you can just imagine. I mean, I don't know what it was like back then, but, you know, just living in sin. Till he ran out of cash. Eating pig food that nobody gave me had to steal. So I guess he was living in there too. Came to himself. <clears throat> Said it was a far off land, a far off journey to get there. So, you know, it was a long time to get home probably. Because he's walking, didn't have a car. He's still ways off and his dad sees him. The father sees him and runs to him. This is my point, guys. This is where I'm getting the whole story. Cool, but and good and awesome. Runs to him. But one of the things he did was tell the servants, he said, get the best robe I have. Not one that he just bought at Walmart. There wasn't a Walmart back then, but not a hand-me-down, not one that was moth-eaten, sitting in the back of his closet. The best he had. And he put it on him. But guys, this is my point. When he put him on him, and he was standing in front of him, the father looked at him with love. My son. <clears throat> the best he had, or the worst he had. He was a scoundrel. Okay, if it, it, most of you that have kids, if it was your kids and they came back and they had gotten on drugs and all kinds of crazy stuff, I, the people out in the families on drugs, but drinking probably and we're as women and stuff, you know, you have a laundry list. Well, you can come back, but how are you going to pay me back? How are you going to pay your brother back? How are you going to rectify, re re remedy the situation. What are you going to do? How, are you going to repent? You can't live in the house, but you can live in the garage because they don't trust you. Um, you got to go to AA or drug rehab or whatever. You really need to clean up because you look like a pig, smell like a pig, because you probably haven't bathed in days, if not months. And you probably still got pig food stuck in your teeth because you haven't had a chance to brush them. Clean up first. No, none of that. Put the clean, best robe he had on. Man, most of us wouldn't do that, would you? I mean, if I'm, you know, I deal with the homeless a lot. I would probably want him to take a shower before I give him something nice to put on. Simple common sense, seemingly. 
It's in Revelation, guys. Jesus has a robe of righteousness for us, dipped in the blood of the Lamb, a white robe, without spot, blemish, or wrinkle. There's other verses in there, too. <clears throat> Why? So when we come before the Father, yeah, the sin's still there. That, that pig food was still on that kid. But you could see the robe. That's what God sees. That robe of righteousness. Of course it's a choice, guys. It, I'm not saying that if you, you know, that's what he wants. That's the offering he wants. That sin that's within. Those dark, deep, hurtful places, ugly Messy, stinky. Because <clears throat> he sees us then with that robe of righteousness uncovered on the blood of the lamb, his son's sacrifice. Not our lame sacrifices. They're not, they're not, they're not worthy anyhow, guys. There's nothing we got that's worthy to bring to him. But our obedience and our availability. Because he wants to talk to us. He wants us back, guys. All the time he's saying, come, come on, come on to the wedding. Come just like you are. There's the robe. Okay, that's one piece of it. Okay. Then, this is another piece. I'm going to add this in there. And then I'm going to end with the precious story about a dog. <clears throat> he wants the stinky stuff, guys. The messy, dirty, ugly stuff. Okay, guys. I've got a friend... That's in the homeless ministry now. He's a director at a, at a place. But he wasn't. And he didn't have a job. <clears throat> he was smoking crack. And he said, God, I'm just really tired, God. God, I just got out of prison. had been out of prison. And just, man, his life was a mess. And he's smoking crack. I was all right, I'm drinking coffee. So. Hopefully that's not my crack. Kidding. Um... <clears throat> And he's smoking crack. And he laid down behind a dumpster. Fell asleep. I said, God, if you're real, just, just help me, God. Simple prayer. Tired of his life. Messed up, jacked up. You can just imagine. How many of y'all are there right now? How many of y'all been there? How many of y'all are hiding things? And you're there, you're just hogwashing and got polished suit on or your best robe or whatever and but your heart's not right <clears throat> he wants all of you guys he wants your sin that's within that's the sacrifice he wants laid down fell asleep woke up and there's two men that's a ministry called men of nehemiah here in dallas i think it's other places in the country too he picked him up, ministered to him, brought him to the Lord. And that's his testimony. God didn't meet him in a building. He met him behind a dumpster. A place where you throw away trash. He thought his life was trash. Stinky, dirty, ugly, sinful, crack-infested, thief and a robber. Because that's why he went to prison for stealing car parts. He'll tell you. Then, recently, and I'm not going to give you the details of it, but someone I know, toilet stopped up for like the third or fourth time. Tried to fix it. Sewage water kind of creeping up even from underneath the tile in the kitchen. Messy, ugly, stinky. A week later, everything's not fixed, but it's gonna get fixed, and the insurance is gonna take care of it, and the whole front of their house is gonna get remodeled. Brand new, all the way down to giving them some cash for towels. Now they're thanking God for it. 
Stinky. See, you know, I know that's, you know, kind of a little out there it's in the natural, but the other one is a lot more in the spiritual, but still. This is one stinky part for me. Dirty. <clears throat> I had this dog, her name was Olive Oil. And I came back to the Lord from a prodigal son. That's a long story. Just look at my story about my testimony, about my uncle God's, my testimony is God's grace. <laughs> but she was there when I came back. And after that, when I finally did really come back to the Lord and really gave him all the stinky stuff, dirty stuff, and my life was completely changed. Two in the morning, he wake me up. This morning was 12. This, I'd hear this little dog's pitter-patter come down the hallway. And she'd sit on my lap. Pretty much the whole time I'd pray, her right next to me. And then we'd go to bed together again. She died. Pretty suddenly. And it hurt. I was a little mad at God. And my wife saw how upset I was. Seven days. She started looking on the internet for dogs. And on the sixth, seventh day, we got a dog. It looked a lot like her. My wife named her Precious. But it still hurt. Well, Precious was born when she was born. We got her from a rescue lady. This was the story. Probably, well, anyhow, I don't need to tell, tell the whole story, but <clears throat> the dog was born and the, 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 all the dogs were born, all the puppies were born. And the dog was just laying there and the lady was like, came back about 10 minutes later, looked at her, and she's like, man, there's something still wrong with that dog. Well, she realized she still had a puppy in her that was precious. She was born dead. One breathing, the lady had to revive her. No telling how long she'd been, you know. So she was kind of brain, she was brain damaged, kind of, you know. I love the dog, but she's brain damaged. She just, she's not there in some areas. And so she's skittish. And just, so I never could take her out of the house. Oh, for about two years. I mean, I couldn't even take her out for a walk. My other dogs got trained real quick. Well, she'd poop and pee on the floor all the time. Long story, but... So six in the morning, my wife would wake up. We don't even couldn't even keep any rugs in the house. My wife hates stinks. Of course, we'd have some pretty heated arguments about it, but I got to where I loved the dog after a while. We had her for a couple of years. Should have got rid of her right away, probably, and it wouldn't hurt. Finally, my wife had enough. The dog diary on the floor. Well, she'd wake up at 6 in the morning and step and pee. Of course, we'd have some pretty hated arguments. And I just kind of blew it off and ignored her because I wanted to keep the dog. Hurt. My other dog, but it was sin. My sin. I ignored, you know, my wife over a dog. And even probably deeper than that. <clears throat> so one day, the diary in the house, my wife just threw her out, threw her out of the yard. And she ran off. And we chased her down for about 15, 20 minutes and the neighbors saw her and people were looking for her and she was gone. And the first night, I was really kind of mad at my wife. And, but yet not, but didn't, we just really didn't talk about it. I didn't really hardly pray about it much. Well, that night, my wife sat out in the garage. Slept out in the garage with her phone in the air, holding her phone up with praise and worship music because that's what we would do when we were gone. The dog would we'd leave the radio on for the dog. TV on for the dog. 
Oh, but you'd come back. That morning, or the day or two later, four in the morning, it's raining. My wife's walking through the muddy alley. I can hear her out there praying and looking for the dog. Three days, guys. I didn't see the dog at all after the first 15 minutes for three days. Drove all over the neighborhood, up and down alleys, you know, with a five mile radius. Called the dog, my wife did. It was a Tuesday morning, my wife went to church to go to prayer and it was like quarter to six in the morning. This is what this is my point. God God needed that stinky part of my life. I'm a stinky dog. Her name was Precious. It's on it's on the it's on the internet. Come home, Precious. That's what he's saying to you guys. Come home, Precious. But so I prayed and I said, God, the enemy, the devil, is making my wife feel like this was her fault. I could see it. She was really tore up. But it was my fault, my sin, my disobedience to you, to my wife, even to the dog. But it, not training it properly, not, you know, it's letting it poop and pee in the house. I tried, I did, not like I should have though, probably, honestly. <laughs> so kind of halfway. I said, Jesus, what would you do? What do I do? Because I don't know. I'm hurt. My wife's hurt. The dog's gone. Three days. And, and like I said, this dog was retar is retarded. And I hate to say it, I love the dog. She's gotten a lot better now, but seemingly over the past six, eight months, but still... She's a sweet dog. And it was breaking my wife's heart. And she felt like she felt like she abandoned this dumb dog. And the enemy was using that to, to keep pressing. And that's what he's doing with your hidden sins, guys. He wants to keep that hook in you. You can't come to God because you're a dog that just pooped on the floor. What do I do, Jesus? Sitting in my prayer chair, it's quarter to six. He says, get up. The prayer chair is about five feet from our front door. I'm looking at the front door and there's a cross above the front door. He said, go to the, go to the front door, open the door, go out on the porch and call her home. Obedience, God. I was like, man, it's kind of broken hearted. And I was like praying. And I was like, okay, God, I didn't go out there with Faith is the grain of a mustard seed. Say to this mountain, be thou cast into the sea and be removed and watch it just move away. I didn't go out there with, hey, I'm going to, you know, storm the gates of hell and rip them off their hinges and bust the devil in his face. None of that. Just obedience. About as calm as I'm talking now. Precious, just come home. Went back in the house. Three times I went out there. Third time I sat on the porch. Not knowing what was going to happen. Had no idea. Looked across at the neighbor's house. <clears throat> Precious, just come home, honey. And I look up. And at the end of my driveway, on the street. Is Precious looking at. And my heart just leaped out. God wasn't through yet. She looked at me for about five minutes and then she just bolted down the street and I couldn't see her anymore. Running the house. Gotta grab my keys. I'm in my bathrobe pajamas. <clears throat> Gotta grab my keys. Run after her and the Lord said, no, go get dressed. Grab a piece of sausage, get in your car and go after her. Okay, God, okay. So take off my pajamas, put on my pants and shoes, and you know, that took five minutes. That I didn't think I had. I didn't want to lose the dog. But I didn't know where she went. Jumped in the car, drive, and get to the end of the street. 
Where do I go, God? Where do I go? Go straight. Go three or four blocks down. Now, what, God? Turn right. Go down the alley. Get to the end of the alley five or six blocks later. Now, what, God? Can I can go to the right, to the left, straight? No dog. He said, turn right. Turn right. A couple houses down. There's my dog. So I throw the piece of sausage to her. There's Precious. She just looks at me, looks at the sausage. I'm like, man, that dog's been out for three days. She's probably really hungry. Didn't even eat it. Called her. She just kind of looked at me with this really dumb look. <clears throat> Took off again. I bolt after her again and get in the car, get, chase her, you know. I see her running between two houses, about half, about a ha halfway down the street again, four or five houses down. I see her run, bolt between these two houses. Just got a glimpse of her, really. <clears throat> so I run between these houses and look to the left. There's a big open backyard, but the one to the right there's a fence. And I look a little closer, and there she is cowering in the bushes. She had gotten trapped somehow, kind of. And, but she was still not trapped. She was 30 or 40 feet away. So I slowly walked over there, got to calling her name. Kind of got her up, picked her up. My wife called crying at 7 in the morning for prayer. I think I found her. I think I found her. She's at the dog pound in Garland and da da da. And now she's sitting at home. So my moral of the story is if God cares so much about a dog, Stinky dog. In my offering of my sin, when I finally brought it to God and repented, it said, here it is, God. I brought her home. So if God cares so much about a dog, her name was Precious. How much more precious are you? So he wants the places nobody wants. The people nobody wants. The dirty ugly, stinky, sinful place. That's the acceptable offering to the Lord, not your best. Because your best ain't going to cut it. He wants your worst. Places you won't even go in your heart. What are they, guys? Most people that have drugs have some kind of childhood trauma and drama and just in their sicknesses. I get all those guys. I've been in some of mine and be like, <clears throat> what's your worst? What's at your worst day? Your worst time? Because he wants to break those chains and set you free. That's your value to him. Your freedom. Worship him in spirit and truth. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The enemy wants to hold you and weigh you down. That's why God wants that offering of your sin. Because that's acceptable to him. Because then he can come in to your life. Not, this is getting a little long. So I need to do another message. Um, but anyhow, this, the other message is going to be we want an outpouring of the Holy Ghost and a new wine, but he wants the old wine skin gone and the pouring out of our sin before he can come in. So anyhow, that's all another message, the outpouring. Until we pour out, he can't pour in. So anyhow, he wants your dirty, ugly, stinky, Bald-headed, whatever. Are you hiding? Get him and Eve. God's calling. Jesus is calling. Where are you? Quit hiding. Love you guys. <laughs>